now for Heather Love. So for those of us following your work, we've seen you move from uh, stunningly sensitive queer literary scholarship to a different backwards gaze to a history of empirically based sociological practices of description. Um, and we wanted to ask you about, about that transition. Um, it's when we will hear you talk, we'll, we'll know why, but if you could tell us uh, more about um, why you feel you uh, switch to these kind of uh, switch methods, but also how you're reflecting on questions of method as a scholar of sexuality, and also maybe more broadly, what does queer studies uh, look like when it draws from social sciences or from a history of social sciences? Okay, thank you guys. Uh, just to add to everyone's thanks, but I feel like um, I owe special thanks because since the criteria for inviting people were basically working outside of like, say, the Anglo-European context and in the past, I don't do either one of those things, as you guys well know. So um, I feel lucky to be included in this conversation with such amazing scholars doing such important work. Um, and um, yeah, I think uh, just to say, like, I think I do have a claim to the philology piece here. But it's a claim that's so um, co like uh, coterminous with my entire life that that's kind of the problem. That's trying what I'm trying to talk about. Mm -hmm. Okay. My childhood home also makes an appearance. <laughs> so whatever, wh whatever, why? I guess the disciplining thing, maybe. Mm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Okay. So recently I've been questioning the disciplinary and methodological coordinates of queer theory, but I've mostly bored from the inside. My education in feminism, psychoanalysis, and post-structuralism with a focus on 20th century Euro-American literature prepared me very well for the advent of queer theory. This disciplinary fit has helped me professionally and intellectually. It helped me to get a job teaching gender studies in an English department where I was like 100% recognizable to them, even though I was working on queer topics. Getting some big questions off the table, like what is my object, why am I doing this, makes it easier to do your work and to sound like you know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And in a way, you do. So you might ask, if everything's so great, what am I doing at this conference on queer method? What's the problem? I think some, a couple things happened, um, sort of big picture stuff and then personal stuff. Big picture. Um, the fields that I'm in and their context changed radically over the past couple of decades. There have been multiple critiques of the parochialism of literary studies, obviously English, um, but also comparative literature, global anglophone, world literature, and so on. Deconstruction and psychoanalysis, although they're making a strong appearance today, have been displaced, I think, from the center of humanist inquiry. So those tools, those sort of go-to tools, no longer necessarily felt like they were as um, sort of uh, contemporaneous as they mm -hmm. had once felt. And queer theory was progressively opened, sometimes painfully, uh, by many of the scholars in this room to questions of geopolitics, race, thinking about history of liberalism, economic questions, transgender frameworks, and to many other histories, methods, and tools. This is obviously an unfinished project, and there's no end to it. But that happened, has been happening. Finally, I think uh, significant is the crisis in the humanities. I want to put quotes around it, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the need to justify what we do to multiple audiences, mm. and in the absence of many of the traditional material, social, and ideological supports. Mm -hmm. This has all resulted in a sustained crisis, uh, sometimes productive, sometimes not so much, of method the need to justify ourselves. I'm going to give you just a little taste of what this sounds like in um, my field or sort of fields around me. Um, and this is a moment in an essay from 2013 by Michelle Chauli called Criticism and Style that appeared in uh, New Literary History, which is actually the place where a lot of this conversation about method has been happening in literary studies and around it. This is Chauli. Quote, the interpretive disciplines would like to be able to declare what exactly it is that we study. Compared to other disciplines we have, which have, or believe they have, a firmer grasp of their objects of study, our field remains underdetermined. 
Yet the objects we attend to also exceed the boundaries of what we expect an ordinary object of study to be. For under certain conditions, anything can come to be artistically meaningful. For what interest is not the object as in itself it really is, but the object as its force registers in a human being with his or her own history and style. So I think Choli does a nice job of getting at the paradox faced by humanists, humanity scholars, people in the interpretive disciplines who tend to swing between having no object and being able to study literally anything. For queer studies, which took a stronger stand even, I think, against the concept of the object as in itself it really is, the unmooring of the interpretive disciplines robbed the field of its traditional sparring partners and its points of reference. <laughs> so while many scholars are insisting, and have been for a while, that queer theory must change its objects of study, right, open up the field, there's also the question looming over us of whether queer studies can have an object at all. What is queer theory about? Okay, so that's a very, very cursory sketch of the big picture. Now to my own personal crisis in the humanities. Uh, and this is basically uh, trying to kind of give some account of the ways that I've struggled with the limits of my training. So my fit with queer studies, again, in a kind of uh, literary um, interpretive disciplines kind of mode, made it possible for me to uh, kind of tool up and, and develop expertise about some things, textual erotics, say, or the discursive con constitution of the subject. But I think the training also made other aspects of the world inaccessible to me. I'm not blaming it, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Recently, in my work on the history of the post-war human sciences, mm. I've been exploring modes of accessing the world that are not primarily aesthetic or linguistic. Mm. And at lunch, I was calling myself a behaviorist, so that mm. would be like the bad word for what I'm doing. <laughs> Bad object. Bad. <laughs> very bad. Very, very bad. <laughs> we're, we're into disciplining already. <laughs> here, here it comes, yeah. So the accounts that I've been researching, fine-grained accounts of small-scale social worlds, are not literary, but they share features, scale, the use of detail, mm. complexity with novelistic realism. Mm -hmm. So I've been working on microsociologists like mm -hmm. the Canadian-American scholar Irving Goffman mm -hmm. or Harold Garfinkel. Um, got a Garfinkel fan here. <laughs> um, who describe ubiquitous kind of mid-American settings, offices, street corners, living rooms, in such exhaustive detail that they make the familiar strange. Now these accounts obey the protocols of the social sciences. They're written in a voice of neutral authority quite often. They aim for accuracy and even objectivity. And I just want to say that I think although such modes of description have been put to violent uses and still are, I don't think that those uses exhaust the potential or meaning of description. Hmm. So I think about things like Carolyn Steedman's meditation on Mayhew's interview with the watercress girl in Landscape for a Good Woman, hmm. or the afterlife of Garfinkel's case study of Agnes in Transgender Studies, or Toni Morrison's activation in Beloved of the documents recording Margaret Garner's active infanticide. These historians and critics and novelists engage documents that are records of violence, but these are also documents complicit in that violence through their means of representing them. I'm not trying to contest that, okay? Um, but those who came after to cite Lauren Berlant on the case study decided that these events, quote, deserved better genres. <laughs> Now it's my job to work with those better genres. I have the enviable job of working with like really great genres as an English professor. But I've been trying to come to terms with those original accounts and this is not something that's new to historians. That's your job, but it's different for me. And specifically to try to make a kind of strong case and even an ethical case that qualities like objectification and neutrality, which are precisely what trouble us about those documents, are to be valued in the sense of giving us access to those events in the first place. Okay, so it's like an English professor trying to make a case for objectification and neutrality. These are disciplinary uh, enemies of us. I think the utility of such accounts is at stake in the 1990 Linda Gordon-Jones-Scott debate. 
In her review of Heroes of Their Own Lives, The Politics and History of Family Violence, Joan Scott criticizes Linda Gordon for depending too much on, quote, literal descriptions um, from welfare caseworkers. As a result, she argues, Gordon's account is, quote, caught within the social control framework. Mm. Scott also takes issue with Gordon's suggestion that there are, quote, real family oppressions experienced, quote, outside the labels imposed by experts. And Gordon responds, quote, I stand by my conceptualization here. Indeed, I think my version of the interrelation between the actual fists battering women's and children's bodies and competing understandings of those assaults is a better rendition than one gets by erasing the distinction between physical experience and its interpretation. Mm. Now, I, don't, I think we could open the question of whether Scott's robust account of social construction, quote, erases the distinction between physical experience and its interpretation. Even without deciding that case or, or agreeing with Gordon on that point, I don't think it's necessary to go that far in order to see how much Gordon takes, besides a social control framework, from those reports mm. with their literal descriptions. Mm. Is Gordon's invocation of, quote, actual fists battering women's and children's bodies foundationalist? Yes, it is. Is it melodramatic? Sure. But having been witness to plenty of actual family oppressions myself, I'm thankful for Gordon's blunt insistence here. Though I've been trained to insist that everything is interpretation, which of course it is, and to hold the flag for better genres, which I do, I don't want to let go of those reports. They are like tear sheets from the novels that I read obsessively during my adolescence, records of the literal truth I could not see. So how is my own personal crisis in the mm. humanities, that's the outlines of it, inflected my understanding of queer theory? Working on the post-war history of sociology opens up a different history for the field, clearly that, you know, as many people have shown, has been disavowed by scholars in the humanities. But it's also given me some conceptual traction and helped me to articulate responses to the anti-disciplinary, anti-method stance of queer studies. These are responses, I'm trying to formulate responses that are not just about rigor or responsibility, mm. but about making the case that declaring that we do in fact have an object, that that's a case worth making. Mm. That this is not just conservative, that there's an ethical case to be made for queer method, I guess. Mm. For me, this means sacrificing fit and allowing for awkwardness. Not unknowing, because I think I know how to unknow, but awkwardness. <laughs> The awkwardness of grappling live and in public with bad genres, and even worse, events. Hmm. 